right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Coley, for arranging that. Uh, welcome, Clara. We see you're hard at work already. Um, so welcome to the formal part of our educational rounds. Uh, today's topic is uh, cornea. We've got uh, two of our residents, Mohab and uh, Ellen, Mohab el and Ellen Zhu, as well as one of our fellows, Nazar Din, joining Dr. Chan. So Dr. Clara Chan is a specialist in cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery, and an assistant professor in our department. <clears throat> she teaches fellows as part of the Cornea Fellowship Program at the Toronto Western Hospital and is also the medical director of the iBank of Canada, Ontario Division. Uh, she's uh, <clears throat> published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, taught many courses, and has received awards uh, from the American Academy of Ophthalmology and serves on the Cornea Clinical Committee of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeries. And recently, Dr. Chan was uh, listed on the 2021 Ophthalmological Power List, recognizing the top 100 most influential female figures in ophthalmology. So thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning, Clara, and uh, organizing this round for us so we can begin. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just trying to stop the feedback. Sorry, I have two screens open. Okay. Um, do you see my screen shared? I just wanted to start with that. Um, if you're not in presenter mode yet, Clara, but we do see your screen. Okay, yeah, it doesn't fill the whole screen, but um, just wanted to quickly, I do have some financial disclosures. Um, these are the objectives of our talk, and there's going to be two presentations uh, from the two residents and about 20 minutes each. Um, and I just wanted to share this video that I found. Um, of Dr. Hurwitz. Um, I'm not sure if the sound plays. I think there's some, oh, it's not playing. Oh, Sir, you you're, you're not in presenter mode yet. You're just on uh, <clears throat> thumbnails. Okay, me... Do you know how to make me into presenter mode? Or hang on. Uh, so Claire, at the top, if you just hit slideshow, okay. top of your screen. Slide. Um... And then play. Uh, so on my, let's see, uh, under Zoom or? No, on, on PowerPoint. Oh, on PowerPoint, okay. Yeah, there you go. Is it working now? Um, not, not yet. It's like frozen on, um, hang on, you know what? Uh, can I call in maybe and do, maybe I can, because I have two screens running, so <laughs> that might be why it's messing up the Zoom. It thinks you one of You might be sharing the wrong window then. Oh, hmm. let me see. It's the right window. I see it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Resume you're, you're sharing. Different, you have two different computers or two screens I've, on one computer? I have two screens. Yeah, so, so that might be tripping uh -huh. you up because you're in presenter mode, I think, maybe. Um, okay, let me try this. Okay, is that working now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. good. Okay, sorry about that. So financial disclosures, objectives, and I did want to share this video that I found from my graduation dinner as a resident, um, and it was when Dr. Um, Hurwitz was still chair, and um, you don't hear the volumes right now, I think. I didn't have time to like figure out how to get Zoom to play video sound off my computer. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to share. It's just nice to see him um, animated and he was short to the point um, and helped others sort of raise up others. Uh, and I just wanted to share with the residents that your residency time is amazing. So enjoy it. Uh, you make close friends. And it's just a great time. So learn everything you can, um, and you know, learn from your mentors, uh, learn from your co-residents, um, and it's uh, it's a really um, amazing time. You don't realize it sometimes until later how much impact everyone has had on you. So with that, uh, maybe you do hear some of the sound. It's just a bit delayed. This was from a CD that I converted to YouTube, or at least like a video snippet. Um, and so I just wanted to share that um, back at the time when I walked into grad night and I saw this videographer and I thought, oh my God, my dad hired a videographer for my ophthalmology <laughs> graduation. 
dinner it seemed very ridiculous, um, but now it's really nice to see. So with that, I'll um, So I wanted to acknowledge the residents who are presenting and um, Nizar, the fellow that helped to coordinate these. So I'll be commenting as the residents present. Um, and so maybe I'll ask, uh, I think Ellen, you're going first to share your screen to go ahead. Are they sharing okay? Yep, you're good to go, Ellen. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Zhu, a PGY3 resident at U of Toronto. So I recently transferred from U Montreal to Toronto uh, last July. I haven't had the chance to meet uh, many of the attending physicians. So it's very nice to virtually meet you all here. So today with MOHAP, uh, Nisar and Dr. Chen will present a few cases about HSV keratitis in patients who are immunocompromised. So to start, here's a poll question for everyone. What is your first line treatment for one of the meal HSV keratitis? Is it well, well tracks 500 TID, acyclovir 400 five times a day, femcyclovir 500 daily, or deployment and lubrification? Give that a second here, Ellen. Seems to be a bit of a split here. There you go. Good. So most people choose our tracks. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, the uh, the Valtrex is certainly uh, a newer antiviral, and so I think with the percentages, we see people kind of moving toward use of Valtrex, and uh, we'll dive right into a case that will sort of explore some rationale behind Valtrex versus acyclovir. So, so let's introduce our patient, Mr. AM. It's a 49 year old man. He is known to have acute myeloid leukemia and received bone marrow transplant in November, 2021. After the procedure, uh, he developed graft versus host disease and is closely followed by his hematologist. Luckily his AML is at bay and in remission at the moment. He takes a few medications, uh, including cy cyclosporin, um, pasoconazole as antifungal, latamovir, which is a prophylaxis for CMV, but not for HSV, as well as a PPI. As for his eyes, he, has, he had two doses of uh, Moderna vaccine last year, two we weeks after his second dose in June, 2021, he developed the first episode of HSV keratitis. At that time, he was outside Canada, so he was treated by his GP with topical acyclovir in his home country uh, without any PO antiviral medications. And he gradually made a recovery from that episode. In late December, he showed up in our clinic with yet another episode of acute HSV keratitis. There was a large dendrite on the cornea and he was very photophobic, was in pain. The vision of the involved eye on the right was 20. 30, which is quite similar to the good eye. He was then started on PO acyclovir and continued his acyclovir ointment obtained from his home country. A week later, he returned for a follow-up. There was still a big dendrite and he felt the right eye vision had declined slightly. Given the lack of clinical improvement with the current treatment, the team decided to switch the medication to PO femcyclovir and also switched the topical uh, medication to gain cyclovir gel, which he obtained from a local company pharmacy in Toronto. Dr. Chen also performed a rose bangle debridement on the same day. Then three weeks later, he returned for another follow-up. His vision is stable and he was less symptomatic. His, his keratitis, his keratitis um, had turned the corner with the trial of debridement PO femcyclovir and topical gancyclovir. So, so we decided to continue on the same medication and we touch base with him later this month. With that, we arrive at our first uh, panel discussion point. First, what is the preferred first line treatment for HSV keratitis? 
So Dr. Yeah. Chen. Yeah, we can look at all these questions together and um, you know, there's, there, you could talk about each of these questions could, could be a very involved discussion. Uh, but for me, I, I do prefer Valtrex. Um, I know that it has a better chance of, uh, you know, working right away um, in terms of in case there's any kind of resistance, it's a newer drug, it's somewhat better tolerated in terms of GI symptoms, I find. Um, and in terms of for vaccination correlation with HSV reactivation, we have seen some inflammatory cases where, you know, this is a bit unusual for it to be a primary, um, like the HSV epithelial disease being flared in association. Uh, we've certainly seen sort of more the immune stromal keratitis uh, being flared up after uh, the vaccination, but that can also um, happen after someone's like sick or their immune system's down or they've been in the sun for a long time. Um, but uh, maybe I'll ask, uh, I think Paul, if you're on the phone or if you're there as a panelist, I think I saw you. I think you have a preference to start with acyclovir. Is that correct? You want to share some of How your- How do you know that? <laughs> you see my patients. First of all, um, that was a great wellness session. And I thank uh, Yumi and, uh, and Radha and everyone for organizing that. And also thanks for the great video there. That was amazing. Brings back a lot of great memories. You're 100% right about residency. Enjoy it while you can, you residents. It only gets better afterwards, but you really have to enjoy the residency. It's the best time. Um, I do like acyclovir uh, primarily because I think the majority of patients sometimes can't afford it. One advantage of using Valtrex is it's TID dosing versus uh, five times a day. But I find that some of my patients can't afford it. And so I can just write it as acyclovir, 800 milligrams, a half tablet, PO five times a day. And then, and then they use a limited use code 95, which then makes the access more available for people who uh, are have covered, uh, don't have drug coverage and helps to, to pay, it takes that hurdle out of the way. But I agree with you, Valtrex, I think is a good option as is uh, Fambir. Mm -hmm, thank you. And Alan, have you seen any associations with the COVID vaccine and, and HSV or immune disease in your practice? Uh, yeah, I have actually. We've had a couple of uh, reactivation of herpes simplex. We had one interesting, it was an immune competent lady. And we know that simplex is uh, unilateral in about 90% of immune competent individuals. She actually got it in her other eye uh, and it was culture positive. Interestingly, um, I haven't seen any new, excuse me, zoster infections, but we have seen reactivation of dormant zoster, uh, you know, in that two to three week period uh, following uh, uh, their vaccination. And I believe it was primarily after their second vaccination that we've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And um, David, I think David Rootman's on the line. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, historically prior to having oral antivirals as being our mainstay of treatment, you know, we had Baroptic and um, you know, the, we mentioned in this case that Rose Bengal was used, which is an antivirucidal agent. Are there any other kind of more historical ways that you used to manage HSV epithelial disease before our oral sort of regimen available? Oh, not sure if David is there. <laughs> it's okay. So um, we can maybe move on then and... Uh, discuss the case still. Okay. All right. So in the next few slides, we will explore the mechanisms of action for the antiherpetic medications. So in fact, all these molecules are nucleoside analogs that inhibits viral replication by blocking the DNA polymerase as outlined in orange here. And all these molecules can also cross react with the human DNA polymerase causing some side effects such as nausea and vomiting. We can further divide the antiherpetic meds into two groups. The first groups are the cyclovirs. Once they get inside the cell, they must be processed by uh, viral thymidine kinase. It's a protein that provided by the virus themselves. Once they are fully phosphorylated, they are then moved on to uh, the nucleus and block DNA polymerase. The second, the second group includes the cytophavir, phoscarnate, and trifluoridine. They are independent of the viral thymidine kinase. Once they get into the cell, they move to the nucleus directly and ready to do their job. So for anti-herpetic medications, 
the viral DNA pole is the final substrate, and there are two ways for the virus to mutate and escape the medications. One is to mutate the thymidine kinase, so they will not process the cytovirus. Another way is to mutate the DNA pole, and that is a much bigger problem because they can render all the medications ineffective. It is interesting to point out that cytovirus and foscarnate block DNA pole in a slightly different way. So the hope is that if mutation only renders um, the enzyme insensitive to foscarnate, we can still use cytovirus. The molecular pathways we discuss of all these for all these medications have their clinical Im implications. A cyclovir is the most specific for viral DNA pole, and that's why it is the least has the least toxicity. At the same time, a cyclovir can readily induce viral resistance as well. Among healthy people, less than 0.5% will have HSV that is resistant to a cyclovir, but that number jumps to 5% in patients who are immunocompromised. And 95% of these mutations happen in the viral thymidine kinase. So when we decide on a medication for patients with um, HSV keratitis, acyclovir is a sensible medication to start with for patients who are healthy and immunocompetent. But for those who are immunocompromised, it is much better to start with valcyclovir. If none of the cyclovirs work, it's most likely that the thymidine kinase has mutated. So you can escalate the treatment to foscarnate or cytovirus. In the last part, we will take a quick look at the safety profile between the two medications, acyclovir and valcyclovir. In immunocompetent patients, they are very comparable in their side effect. And the question is, do they have similar safety profiles in patients who are immunocompromised? We ask that question because there is an article on focal points suggesting that valcyclovir is associated with more thrombotic microangiopathies such as TTP or, um, or HS, HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, in immunocompromised patients. But is that really the case? So we did a literature review, and here is a very good article published on the journal Blood. In this randomized double-blind multicenter clinical trial, they recruit a large number of patients um, in each group and compare the side effects between valcyclovir and acyclovir in CMV prophylaxis in patients who are immunocompromised. The researchers did very frequent blood work and had a very low threshold in calling a thrombotic microangiopathy or TMA episode. For example, if they saw the schistocyte on blood smear are showing up, or there is an elevation of lactate dehydrogenase, they will call this a TMA episode. When they look at the results, both groups had a very low incidence of TMA episodes between two and three, and the two medications, in fact, also had similar profiles in their overall side effects. The paper also mentioned that thrombotic uh, microangiopathy may not be related to the medications, but also, but in fact, as a complication of the dysfunctional and dysregulated immune system, especially in those who had uh, HSV, uh, who had HIV. So here is a head-to-head -head comparison between valcyclovir and acyclovir. So valcyclovir dosing is only three times a day compared to the five times a day for the acyclovir, making valcyclovir easier for patient to be compliant. Valcyclovir has a better um, efficacy thanks to its higher oral availability. Um, they share similar safety profile as we just discussed. And valcyclovir um, is likely to induce resistance uh, in HSV virus. As for the pricing, um, the 500 milligram tablet for valcyclovir only costs 61 cents compared to uh, one dollar and twenty-seven and twenty-seven cents for the eight hundred tablet uh, in acyclovir. So for a daily dosing, the, gener the generic formulation for valcyclovir is actually cheaper than the acyclovir. It's important to point out that the both in both medications, the brand name products are much are much more expensive. So it's important to keep in mind um, that for those who have to pay out of the pocket, uh, the generic formulation is better for them. 
So in summary, here are a few take home points. Immune compromised patients have higher risk of a cyclovir resistant HSV. Do you consider the use of valcyclovir well, 500 uh, TID dosing as the first line treatment for HSV keratitis? The generic valcyclovir well, tablets are cheaper than the acyclovir 800 tablet, and the side effect profile in immunocompromised patients are very similar between the two. We do need to be careful in patients who, are, who have renal uh, problems. It's a good idea to put them on annual blood work if we decided to have to put them on long-term prophylaxis. Uh, the compounded gencyclovir 0.15% gel is always available um, in compound pharmacy. And in Toronto, you can find it in Haber's compound pharmacy. So with that, uh, thanks for your patience. And we're uh, ready for some questions. Great, thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, Maybe I'll ask uh, Josh, how often do you find you have to prescribe the gancyclovir gel version? Thanks, Clara. Um, so uh, as you know, a, a uh, gancyclovir gel has to be compounded right now in Canada. Um, they are looking, there's a company looking to bring it in. So it takes a little bit more to work. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little more work to get it. I've found that it's rare. Um, so I've definitely done it a few times, but I think for the most part, um, it, it's quite rare. And, you know, I think, you know, the points were brought up in this talk already, but the, like a true acyclovir resistance, you know, we hear it's going up, we hear it can be high, but then you look at the literature and it's actually very low in most patients. Um, and I always wonder, you know, if, if I'm really querying resistance, if it, if it is resistant or if it's something else that's, that's being missed. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, it, you know, we see HSV, what, like, every fifth patient or something like that in our clinics. And it's, you know, at once a, honestly, like once or once or twice a year that I have to get the encyclovir. I don't know if your practice is different. Yeah, it's, it is rare. Um, I think it's just good to keep in the back of our mind as an option. Like if patients are not improving after I would say two weeks, then something to consider. Um, but Myrna Lichter is asking a question whether graft versus host disease impacts vision. Um, maybe um, we'll have you can pull up your, your talk next as um, answer this. So graft versus host disease certainly can cause a whole you know, collection of problems. Uh, patients who get severe dry eye problems, um, it can cause chronic inflammation. Uh, their meibomian glands completely get obliterated. Uh, the, the inflammatory mediators that infiltrate their lungs and skin and GI system also infiltrate their lacrimal glands and any mucous membrane um, on the eye surface as well. Um, and some get even severe like limbal stem cell deficiency problems. Um, and if they had their, you know, bone marrow donor in conveniently like as a sibling or like a parent or um, a friend, uh, sometimes we can take that identical matched uh, person and use their stem cells to transplant if the patient has visually um, uh, has visually impacted um, symptoms. So uh, yeah, and to conclude, graft versus host disease can be a monster. Um, Josh, you had an extra comment. Yeah, and just one other comment. Um, just just more for the residents and and maybe the the comprehensive that don't see that much HSV. Um, there's an entity called HSV dendritic epitheliopathy that you should know about, which is basically you've killed the live virus and it still looks like there's a dendrite on the cornea. And this is toxicity. Um, and, and it's also, it's, it can be toxicity, but it's also just um, healing epithelium. So even if you treat it with like a cyclovir or something orally, um, you can still have what looks like a dendrite on the cornea for weeks and weeks after uh, it's healed. And this is just healing epithelium. And, and that doesn't mean you've had a treatment failure. Yeah, good point. It's uh, pseudodendrites, uh, essentially. Um, just that area where the virus impacted the cornea, it's neurotrophic along that dendrite, and so it just has trouble healing. Um, but uh, this next case, I think we'll be able to discuss more on that. So go ahead, take it away, Mohan. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Chen. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Mohab al -Dib. I'm one of the second year residents at the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the University of Toronto. And uh, today I'll be talking on herpes simplex keratitis in uh, post-corneal transplant. Um, so to introduce our patient, uh, yeah, he's a 
40 years old male who we saw on July of 2010 uh, with history of recurrent keratoiditis. He was referred to us for further management of corneal scarring, uh, stromal thinning with new vascularization and lipid keratopathy. His vision was 2200 at that time. Um, penetrating keratoplasty was planned and performed, and then the patient was started on uh, Lotamax four times a day and oral acyclovir uh, twice a day. However, unfortunately, the patient was lost to follow up uh, shortly afterwards. Um, nine years later, in October of 2021, um, the patient was referred again by his family physician for persistent uh, redness in the right eye with no pain. His vision in that affected eye um, was 2200 and um, his intraocular pressure was 21. On slit lamp examination, he had an epithelial defect that measured two millimeters by two millimeters um, and um, that EP defect had rolled edges. Um, there was no infiltrate, but there were keratic precipitates uh, distributed infranasally with an anterior chamber inflammatory reaction. The iris had some transillumination defect and posterior synechiae. The examination of the other eye was unremarkable. Our impression was that this is a disciform keratitis and neurotrophic um, keratopathy due to uh, HSV, as well as um, that neurotrophic comp uh, component can also be attributed to his uh, past history of transplant. So we started our patient on PRET forte four times a day and oral acyclovir 1000 milligrams uh, three times a day as well as uh, uh, preservative-free artificial tears. And then we brought the patient uh, back in two weeks. Uh, unfortunately, there was minimal change in the size of the epithelial defect. Um, so now I would like to ask the audience and do a poll question. Um, what would be your next step in management if uh, uh, the epithelial defect persists despite antiviral treatment? Um, increase uh, ocular surface lubrication or consider a corneal transplant, do a tape tersorophy or amniotic membrane transplant. So Mohab, while that's running, there was a question for you in the chat. Was he still taking either the Lodomax or the acyclovir? Um, no, so th that, that was discontinued and uh, the gap between the two uh, like visits is nine years. So uh, it, that was discontinued uh, when we saw him. Thanks. So disregard that response. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, end the poll here. A bit of a split. Three ways. All right. Um, so I see uh, um, uh, there's like a split in, uh, in, uh, in the choices, but nobody chose uh, doing a corneal transplant. Um, so just like very quick comment. So all of these treatments listed are uh, used in management of neurotrophic keratopathy. But before I, we discuss the management further, I just wanted to highlight uh, the grading scheme of uh, neurotrophic keratitis as well as its, its etiology. Actually, so, can you just go back to the image of the actual um, ulcer? I just wanted to highlight the appearance of it. Uh, so any patient who has... Um, you know, this ulcer, you're thinking, okay, um, you know, is it infectious or is it inflammatory? And given the history in this patient, uh, he, you know, had stopped everything. And so you have to treat the viral component. Um, and given his history of inflammation, uh, you know, the, the risk is that there could be some immune stromal keratitis component there as well. Um, and with neurotrophic corneas, there's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword to start steroids. Um, if the eye's inflamed and you do not start steroids, then the epithelium isn't going to heal either because the stem cells are inflamed and not able to function. Uh, but you also do worry about thinning effects. So if these patients are started on steroids, then they do have to be followed closely uh, to monitor um, for any thinning. Uh, but they also, you have to, you know, try to heal the defect using the modalities that we'll discuss. Um, but just briefly, maybe I'll ask uh, Stefan, um, when you see a patient like this, um, you know, what, uh, what's going through your head in terms of how you counsel them? Yeah, I think uh, your discussion about steroids is, you, you know, it's really key because it 
if it's a straight epithelial involvement, then you know usually you you hold off on steroids. But if they have epithelial involvement and stromal involvement and potentially a, a uveitic component, then they do need some steroids. So my general approach is I agree. I mean, I think I need to use some steroids initially, um, whether it's you know BID or or you know in this case QID, and I see how they respond. If I see the epithelium is starting to close then um, I'll kind of continue on. If I see that they don't move, maybe I, I kind of back off on the steroids. But I do think that you need some steroids to kind of address that sort of inflammatory component. And then uh, if they fail to respond and they're still, um, like in this case, it seems like it's uh, probably a stage three uh, NK, then, um, then there's other things available, which I'm sure Mohab will talk about in terms of EMT or autologous serum tears. But uh, um, I do think that, you know, titrating the steroids is, is kind of the first key step in, in my cases where there's uh, epithelial plus disease. Thanks. Uh, okay, um, well, we can continue with our... Mm -hmm. So um, um, I was mentioning uh, the classification of a neurotrophic creatitis. So it's uh, classified according to the Mackey classification into three stages. Uh, stage one is characterized by punctuate epithelial fluorescein staining with uh, golay spots, uh, which are essentially just scattered areas of dried epithelium. Um, there will be increased uh, mucus viscosity, decreased tear breakup time, and uh, rose bengal stain staining in the inferior palpebral conjunctiva. Um, Alex, you want to just, uh, his hand is up, but I just want to catch him before. I'll just, uh, at the next break, I just wanted to make a comment. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, sorry, oh, go ahead. In, in stage two, uh, epithelial defect uh, is typically oval in shape and usually located superiorly. Mm -hmm. The epithelial defect is uh, surrounded by loose epithelium with smooth and rolled edges. Other features would include uh, stromal swelling with the decimate membrane folds as well as an anterior chamber inflammatory reaction. In stage three, uh, the disease progresses into uh, corneal stromal ulceration and can progress further into stromal melting and perforation. Um, so the etiology of neurotrophic keratitis involves any condition that leads to impairment of the trigeminal innervation. The impairment of the trigeminal reflex results in reduced tear film production and blink, blink, uh, blink rate, which leads to spontaneous corneal epithelial breakdown. The causes can be categorized into um, ocular causes such as herpetic keratitis or post-corneal transplant or uh, post-pars plana uh, vitrectomy. Systemic causes include diabetes mellitus, and um, CNS causes usually are related to uh, neurosurgical procedures. And uh, genetic causes could be like Riley Day, Golden Heart Gorlin, or familial high corneal hypothesia syndromes. Um, it's also important to note that etiology is typically multifactorial. In a recent study that was conducted by the cornea team at Toronto Western Hospital, the leading three causes in this study were um, uh, herpetic, uh, neurosurgical, and uh, first plan of attraction. So for, again, talking about the management, the management of neurotrophic keratitis is typically multimodal and follows a stepwise escalation approach that's based on the Mackey classification of the disease, as well as the response to treatment. So for stage one, typically um, they are just given uh, artificial tears and uh, the recommendation is also to avoid uh, uh, topical medications that have preserved this. For stage two, um, these might the choices might include uh, autologous serum tears as uh, Dr. Anton mentioned, um, therapeutic contact lenses and uh, tarsography. For stage three, this might be uh, requiring oral and metalloproteinase inhibitors uh, recumbent human nerve growth factor, uh, or considering doing amniotic membrane transplantation. Uh, but in case this progresses to perforation, then uh, of course, gluing, conjunctival flap, and keratoplasty should be considered. Um, actually, if you can just go back to that slide with the steps, uh, step ladder, maybe Alan, is this a good place? Maybe you could make your comment because uh, it might be addressing management tricks. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, you know, the, the two things that weren't addressed really in the uh, choices with that patient, there was really a lot of sort of epithelium. And I think you've got to, or at least it looked like on the slide, when I think in, in situations like that, I would take a dry wax cell 
and just try to debride that epithelium to give the edges of that ulcer a better um, running board to, to try to re-epithelialize uh, that, that non-healing epithelial defect. So I think if you have necrotic um, epithelium that's just very, very loose, I think it's good to just take that back with, and it's easy to do with the slit lamp. The other thing that I've been doing lately is we've been trying platelet-rich um, uh, PRP for uh, maiden a, a teardrop, and we found that it's really been quite good for healing some of these um, non-healing epithelial defects, and certainly much, 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 much better in terms of cost effectiveness than serminogen, um, which is uh, you know something like a hundred thousand dollars for a treatment. That's um, nerve the nerve growth factor for those who haven't um, heard so of it yet. We've just started looking at that with platelet-rich plasma tears, and um, we've actually had some very good results. So something to keep in mind uh, besides just using serum tears. Yeah, I would say that serum tears is probably easier to access because there's a few ph compounding pharmacies in the GTA who are able to just make it with a prescription quite easily. Um, the PRP requires like a setup and um, you know specialized uh, um, kits that um, Alan's able to, to provide, but um, we'll go on then and see what other options there are. All right. Um, for, so commenting also on like our, our patient's uh, neurotrophic staging, uh, we thought that he had a stage two uh, uh, neurotrophic keratitis based on the MACI classification. So we decided to go ahead and do a tersorophy. So the different types of tarsorophy that we were considering were suture tarsorophy, Botox uh, tarsorophy, and tape tarsorophy. Of those, the least invasive, most easy to perform, and most time and cost efficient was the tape tarsorophy, which is what we chose to do for our patient. So now I'd like to uh, play a video that demonstrates the uh, steps of applying tape tarsorophy. So you can see here that they're, you're, you want the patient, you can, as you're showing them, you teach the family member or the patient to pull up on the upper eyebrow and tell them to look down so that the eyelid crease is completely flattened. And then you apply this one by one inch piece of plastic tape. And the idea is you're just splinting that upper eyelid crease so that it can't activate. Um, so it works like pretty good. Like you can see here, the, the, the pseudo patient is looking up, down, left, right, and, and that upper eyelid just doesn't budge. So it's sort of a cheaper version of the Botox tarsorophy where the injection is made into the levator and Mueller's to sort of inactivate the eyelid, um, except this kind of gives the patient control and they're able to do it, you know, when the tape's loosen, they can replace it themselves. Um, and there's, you know, the, the cost of, of a roll of tape is, is like, Eight dollars instead of the Botox, which is a few, a couple hundred, um, and it's just super easy to, um, to 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 teach the patient to do. And I think in these cases, the patients, in terms of compliance, you do have to explain to them that this is sort of an alternative. Otherwise, we'll have to sew your eyes shut potentially, and that might encourage their compliance a bit. But the problem is they don't feel pain. And so it's uh, trying to get them on board with the multitude of interventions that you're suggesting to them can be a challenge sometimes I find. But this is a great trick. Um, you know, anyone that you want to just encourage their epithelium to heal up quicker or they have lag ophthalmus, um, you know, just applying this bit of tape. Uh, we probably use it at least two or three times a day in clinic. Um, you can go. Oh, Alan, do you have another comment or is that from oh, before? No, sorry, that's from before. Oh. All right. Well, all right, so uh, Dr. Chan and her group did a retrospective interventional case series to report on the outcomes of using tape tarsorphy in eyes with persistent corneal epithelial defect due to various etiologies, including neurotrophic uh, keratitis. Uh, in this study, um, 34 eyes of 33 patients were included and they were followed for at least three months. Um, so uh, resolution was achieved in 29 of these four, 34 eyes with significant improvement in vision. The average time to resolution was 23 days, and none of the eyes that achieved complete, complete resolution had a recurrence. Um, however, unfortunately, two of the patients with neurotrophic keratitis failed to resolve. In our patient as well, the tape tarsorophy failed to achieve, achieve resolution. So um, just uh, want to give uh, this uh, 
for panel discussion and audience question. So what would be your next step if Tapir Sorfi fails? Um, consider suture tersorphy, uh, topical insulin, amniotic membrane transplant, or uh, a recombinant uh, human nerve growth factor such as synergermin. Uh, maybe while the audience is answering, I think David has joined us now. Um, Dr. Rootman, if you're there, maybe you can make a comment about what, you know, in the past, like how quickly would you move to a suture tarsorophy uh, versus sort of the serum tiers? And now that we have access, easier access um, to a few other newer modalities, uh, I guess in the past, it would be like bandage contact lens and then tarsorophy would be historically what was most commonly used. Um, maybe you can give some historical background about um, your approach. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think earlier in my practice, and certainly what I learned in fellowship was, is that uh, the best way to get epithelium to heal is to close the eye completely. And uh, the most common way of doing that was with, uh, with sutures. Um, and that, that works, as, as Dr. Kaufman used to say, works gangbusters. So I think that, um, you know, I, I previously would sort of jump to that uh, more frequently, but now I think we've got other options. Uh, we've, the, the idea of Botox, tarsorophy came around a um, long time ago, and we had the chance to <laughs> utilize Steve Kraft's talents to uh, do the, the uh, Botox tarsorophy. And uh, that works great. And it, it shuts the eye for about six weeks or so, and uh, it's really quite painless for the for the patient. So, so I think that that's a good opportunity. Um, the other thing that came along, which is similar to this tape uh, tarsorophy, was called the Stamler splint. Uh, uh, it was invented by uh, someone in Iowa, and uh, it's basically a little thicker than tape and has a more robust adhesive on the back of it. I think it's similar to the, the plastic that's used for uh, colonoscopy bags. So that was another option that, that came along. And then, then with the resurgence of use of serum tears, I think that, that's been a very useful adjunct. So that's sort of uh, you know the history that I've gone through with these things. Um, but, but most surely a suture tarsorophy you know, is, is a, a great thing to do. It closes the eye, puts it at rest and allows the epithelium to heal. Yeah, great, thank you. I'll just answer some of the questions from the chat. Uh, um, Christine Ehrlich asked if we can use the tape tarsorophy for larger corneal abrasions. Absolutely. Um, even patients with like recurrent erosion, I'll put in a bandage contact lens for them and then just apply the tape over the eyelid um, so that it just gives them that extra relief because they're trying to close that eye because it's uncomfortable. But if it's just naturally closed and stay mm -hmm. open better, we'll give you a so the um, we'll floppy we'll eyelid. Yeah. Hang on, someone's. You can mute him. Okay. Uh, and then also for patients with like floppy eyelids after their cornea transplant surgeries um, or cross-linking surgery, any kind of corneal surgery where the epithelium's abraded and I want their, uh, their floppy eyelids to not impact their healing and have them self-avert while they're sleeping or accidentally rubbing their eyes and their eyelids are so floppy that it flips. Um, I'll put the tape tarsorophy as well on. And it, if you tell the patient not to touch it, it lasts a long time. Like you guys know this, that's the regular plastic patch, uh, tape that we use for eye shields after cataract surgery. Um, and that, uh, that tape is pretty strong. So, you know, if you tell the patient not to touch it and don't shower for 48 hours after surgery, that tape will stay that whole time and work. And that just gives the epithelium enough time to start its healing process. And for healthy eyes, even you know, 48 hours later, if you examine their epithelial surface, um, if it's pr nicely protected, they're probably 80% healed already actually by then. Um, maybe any other panelists comments before our last final slide. Um, in terms of this, um, the options that were were listed here in the in the in the questions. A topical insulin is somewhat more experimental. Um, there's maybe a hand 
two or three papers uh, showing that it's it has some has some benefit. I think Alan has tried it on a couple patients. Um, and in terms of the nerve growth factor, that is a new drug that is Health Canada approved, but the company is just trying to get the um, the the sort of manufacturing process and also the distribution process and the whole system set up on how patients would get it because it's quite complex. It's stored um, in cold. It has to be delivered to the patient. It, and it's like $100,000, as Alan said. So it's very expensive undertaking uh, and without insurance coverage, uh, understandably somewhat cost prohibitive. Um, but that's probably coming down the pipeline and we'll hear more about that. Uh, okay, so we'll just uh, finish off, uh, Mohab. All right, so um, we did uh, immunotic membrane transplantation. Uh, uh, these uh, provide a, a contain growth factor and provide a scaffold for reepithelialization as well as having anti-inflammatory properties. In the past, the form that was present uh, was the fresh frozen uh, uh, type, and that was usually uh, needed uh, suturing. However, uh, more recently, there are commercially available amnions that don't require suturing, such as the cryopreserved Procara or the vacuum uh, dehydrated uh, biodoptics. The cornea group at uh, Toronto Western did a retrospective series on the uh, biodoptics graft and uh, um, in patients with a, a persistent epithelial defect and a, a resolution was achieved in eight out of nine eyes. And the main advantage of this form is that it's readily available for use and easy to store in clinic setting. Uh, this is what we used uh, for our patient and um, the neurokeratitis uh, short, uh, resolved shortly afterwards. So um, just to reemphasize some take home points, um, staging of the neurotrophic keratitis is based on the MACI staging system. The etiology involves anything that leads to impairment of the trigeminal innervation and is often multifactorial. Management is typically multimodal and follows a stepwise escalation approach that's based in, uh, on the response to treatment and depends on uh, disease staging. Taped dorsorphy and dehydrated amnions are uh, cost and time efficient and easy to perform in a clinic setting with good outcomes in management of persistent epithelial defects. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, very nicely presented, are both residents. Um, so the... Uh, the last, we only have, a, we're a little bit over time now, but uh, if there's any other questions, I think someone asked if um, for the, uh, sorry, the, the tape tarsorophy, it's just the regular one inch 3M med pore plastic tape. It has to be the plastic one. The paper one doesn't stick very well. So, um, and I think Hugh McGowan asked for this patient, what was the original indication for the PKP? That was for a corneal scar related to HSV. Um, something interesting is with when we do our uh, transplants and we send the specimen off for pathology, we can actually request for PCR on that cornea transplant if we're suspicious of HSV but potentially never had a formal diagnosis or if we want to know whether there's active HSV in a graft that was done for perforation, for example. I had a patient like that where um, we did the PK as a tectonic graft um, and sent it PCR because the patient was high risk, was an atopic and, and had melted and perfed. So, um, and the PCR came back as positive for HSV. So knowing that we were able to tell him, okay, let's give you max dose um, valve cyclovir to make sure that the HSV that was active in your cornea tissue is really eradicated. Um, so I'll just probably end with that. And if there's any other questions, um, we can stay on for a bit to answer, but the formal presentation is finished and there's a link to the survey so that you can get your CME credits. Thank you. I think that's it. Clara, you nailed it. So there's no more questions in here. Great. Have Thanks. a good Friday, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Fantastic rounds. Thank you. Great Bye. rounds, guys. Good job. Thanks, everybody.